Scott has been a resident of Estes Park for a very long time. I've known him every, almost ever since I've been in Colorado, which is 25 years. Um, he is the, a true field ornithologist. He studies birds uh, by observing them in the field uh, meticulously and patiently. And uh, that is what field ornithology is all about. Um, he does not have a college, he does not have an advanced college degree. He has a college degree from the University of Wisconsin, but he doesn't have a, a, a degree, a master's or a PhD. And that's kind of common in ornithology. You can have field experts in ornithology who do not have an advanced degree. And that's kind of one of the neat things about ornithology, the, the field of ornithology in general. Um, Scott has written several books based on his field observations, books on owls, on, on small owls, large owls. And I, um, I think you have a hummingbird book too, don't you, Scott? You can let us know more about your books when you introduce yourself. Hi, William. And uh, he's also the director of the of CARI, which is the Colorado Avian Research and Rehabilitation Institute. He cares very much about birds. He takes care of birds. And he spends a tremendous amount of time educating the public about birds. So that's, uh, that's a very special attribute of Scott's. We're very glad that Scott is, is working with us here in Colorado and can be a part of this Hummingbird Workshop uh, tonight. So Scott, take it away. Very good, thank you, Nick. So tonight, yeah, can you all can hear me? Yes. You can hear me? Good. So tonight I'm here, of course, to talk about uh, Colorado hummingbirds. I call them jewels of the summer just because they're here in the summer and they're, I just think of them that way. Uh, but before I begin for any presentation, I just like to tell people kind of about who I am and why I'm here. Um, Hold on just a second. So I'm the director of the Colorado Avian Research and Rehabilitation Institute, or CARI. We're based out of Estes Park. We do research and, of course, rehabilitation on a wide variety of species. We do research on northern goshawks, great horned owls, corvids, crows, ravens, magpies, jays, barn owls, boreal owls, Northern pygmy owls. I operate a bird banding station at the YMCA. This is my 24th year at that station. And rosy finches, among a few things. There's a bunch of other stuff, but that's just kind of a, a few things. So things we found through our research is that um, I actually ban more crows than anybody in Western North America. And my oldest crow lived to be 10 years old. What I found through my research is that the crows that are here now in Estes Park or, or Colorado actually will head south and east for the winter and be replaced by birds from the Pacific Northwest. As I've captured birds in Estes Park that have been recovered in British Columbia and Alberta, Canada. Barn owls, I have 33 barn owl boxes placed from Chatfield Reservoir to about Wellington. I also have 10 barn owl boxes in Texas doing research on barn owls because I noticed their numbers have been declining. So I built boxes uh, to specific locations. I've written a book about the barn owls. Uh, and that's a whole nother presentation, of course. Uh, Northern saw wet owls. I operate a banding station here in Estes Park where we target Northern saw wet owls. I started in 2007. I had one of my Northern saw wet owls that I captured in Estes Park in 2012 was recaptured live and released in Eastern Pennsylvania in 2016. I put up nest baskets for long-eared owls. At one point, I had two of these only three known long-eared owl nests in Boulder County. Kestrels, I have 158 kestrel boxes placed from Parker to Wyoming. Um, and we ban all the adults and youngsters looking at nest site fidelity, territory sizes, habitats, and so forth. I had one of my uh, kestrels banded in Fort Collins in 2019, hit by a car and killed in Lubbock, Texas in 2020. This is a photograph of the first documented boreal owl nest in the history of Rocky Mountain National Park. 
So I documented the first boreal owl nest in 2019. I also, in 2004, I also documented the first nesting flammulated owl nest in Rocky Mountain National Park. Pygmy owl, I've been studying pygmy owls for, this is my 24th year studying pygmy owls. And this is one of my nests from last year with two owlets looking out together. Rosy finches, I've actually banded more rosy finches than anybody in the world. I've banded over 5,500 rosy finches. My oldest rosy finch lived to be uh, 12 years old. And of course, hummingbirds. Uh, I operate the bird banding station at the YMCA of the Rockies, one of which, um, one of the things we do there, of course, is catch songbirds and, and hummingbirds is one of those things we capture. And my oldest hummingbird lived to be 10 years old. And of course, this is the end result of my research. Uh, I study a certain bird that I enjoy. And then after I have enough information, I write a book. I also illustrate all the books. Uh, the Small Mountain Owls Revised and Expanded just came out. Uh, it was a, a first book with Small Mountain Owls. Came out in 2009, but I had so much more information. I did a second revised edition this year. The book just came out. I'm also a bird rehabilitator. So when birds get injured in Nestas Park, I do what I can to help rehabilitate them. This is a juvenile bald eagle. This is a uh, sharp shin hawk. As you know, sharp shin hawks notoriously crash into windows. This little fella crashed into a window and had a headache. This is a common night hawk. Uh, they come here, of course, in the spring. And then up here in Nestas Park, we get snow and cold. And so these birds go into what's called torpor. People think it's a dead owl, so they pick it up and then the warmth of their hands, of course, the bird wakes up. They bring the bird to me and I just essentially feed him or her uh, mealworms and things until uh, the bad weather's over and then I let them go. This is a great horned owl that was hit by a car at the YMCA of the Rockies. He had a headache. <laughs> He's in my flight cage before he was released. This is a little northern saw-wet owl. He was actually found in a puddle of water near Glenhaven, and somebody brought him to me, and here he is all cleaned up, just about to go in the flight cage. He was eventually released as well. Here's a Cooper's hawk that uh, had a chiropractor help work on. He crashed into a window and had a, a, a back injury. So he was actually doing an adjustment on the bird, uh, which is pretty remarkable because he did this adjustment, and then a few days later, the bird was released. This is a northern goshawk that uh, crashed into a window at uh, in Estes Park at the library, and he um, had a headache, and now he's in the flight cage as well. He was on release, so all these birds were taken care of and released. I'm also an artist, some of you know. I'm a watercolor painter. I've created my own style of art. It's a combination of Picasso's cubism and realism. Uh, the cubistic painters were interested in showing multiple views of an image in each painting, but their work was always abstract. I love the idea of the multiple views, but I want to work to be realistic. So each painting has three subjects. This is, of course, the Western metal art. And if it fits in the habitat or in the, the in the uh, if it fits in the composition, I'll put a little habitat scene to give you an idea of what kind of habitat to find the bird in. This particular piece, and that was kind of fun when I, I sold it to the client, I gave him the, the piece of barbed wire to frame actually inside the, the frame, which is kind of cool. Here's my northern goshawk, juvenile and belt, northern shrike. It's my broad-tailed hummingbirds, red and blackbird, and of course the kestrels. But of course here tonight to talk about the uh, hummingbirds, I just call them of course jewels of the summer. We have the broad-tailed hummingbird, the black-chinned hummingbird, rufous hummingbird, and of course the calliope hummingbird. So hummingbirds are actually very early arrivers. You know, this, I believe that birds migrate simply due to the length of the day. Otherwise, there'd be no reason for hummingbirds to show up when there's still snow on the ground. And we always get hummingbirds here right around April 15th. And we always get snow end of April, early May, as we did this year. And I believe if they, uh, if they migrated based upon something other than the length of the day, they would wait until it was warm enough for them to get up here and sustain themselves. Uh, but they show up, like I said, before um, April and we always get snow. Uh, they do are able to obviously sustain themselves. They go into torpor, which is a way of lowering the body temperatures at night. Um, so they, they can then go find, and so they find a lot of insects even when there's snow on the ground, it's pretty phenomenal. But they do, of course, that's not, hummingbird feeders are real important to them, but they will find insects even when it's that cold out. 
So I got a number of facts I'd like to point out about hummingbirds. For example, their brains. It's about the size of a pea. However, it's the largest brain of any bird species in the world if you compare the size of the brain to the size of the bird. The brain is 4.2% of their body weight. Hummingbirds can remember every flower they go to every day, and also how long it takes that flower to rejuvenate nectar before they return to it. Hummingbirds can fly forwards, backwards, and even upside down. Hummingbirds, all they can do is essentially perch. They can move a little bit side to side, but they can't walk. They use their feet essentially for scratching, and then of course perching. And the calliope, if you look at the calliope hummingbird, and compare the size of the calliope hummingbird to the distance it migrates, it actually has the longest migration of any bird in the world if you simply compare the size of the bird to the length of the migration. And the gorget is actually a term that um, comes from the old days when knights and armor had a, this protective metal around their throats or necks. That's where the word gorget comes from. It was a metallic um, color. And the term gorget actually, it's gonna go here just a second. Um, the gorgets themselves, um, it's pretty amazing. The colors within them, they are little platelets in the gorgets. And they almost act like a, a filmy substance that enables the, my computer froze up here, so I'll just take just a second here, folks. Um, computer froze up, give me just a second. This happens occasionally when I do these, these um, presentations through this, these Zoom meetings for some reason, I don't know why, but it, it sometimes does. And now we won't go anywhere. Give me just a second here to. So, <clears throat> Scott, I wonder if you close your video, if that might make your screen work. If you stop your video. Uh, what do you mean? Oh, just, I see what you're saying. Just stop the sharing for a second. No, keep sharing, but turn off your video. So we won't be seeing you. We'll just see your screen. When you say turn off the video, what do you mean? Uh, so down at the bottom of your camera, of your screen, you should be able to turn on or turn off your video. Uh, oh, stop video right there. Okay. Gotcha. There you go. And now let's see if that helps um, the, uh, loosen up your screen. Okay. If not, uh, we might have to. Well, there we go. Uh, yeah, it did. Okay, good. There we're back again. Um, so, so anyway, you that's, 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 video uh, off too. And then we won't have this problem again. Oh, turn the video off, you said? Yeah, that, that way we won't have, we won't run into uh, bandwidth problems. So will you be able to see this? Yeah, we can see, we'll be able to see your, your presentation, just not your face. There you go. Oh, great, that does It's probably better that way. Anyway, so the, 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 the bird's throat feathers contain minute, thin, film-like layers called platelets, set like tiles in a mosaic against the dark background. And as the light waves reflect and refract off the mosaic, it creates the colors uh, almost as if a light shining off water or oil. Hmm. Just a second. So more about the anatomy of the, of the hummingbirds, because they're, they're just actually incredible when it comes to the, their anatomy of these little guys. Throws up again. The hummingbird's heart, if you compare the size of a hummingbird's heart to the hummingbird itself, it actually has the largest relative heart size of all birds. And the body temperature, a normal body temperature of a hummingbird is about 105 degrees, and a resting hummingbird's heart rate is about 70 degrees. Hummingbirds have more rods and cones in their eyes than people do. And they're also, like a lot of other birds, are able to see ultraviolet light. 
And of course, as hummingbirds fly, their wings beat so fast that you can actually hear them flying. It's a buzzing sound, as you, many of you know. And then hummingbirds actually have fewer feathers on their body than any other birds in the world. And that allows them to stay lightweight and, and fly fast. Then the body weight, um, So about a quarter of the hummingbird's weight is just their, their breast muscles because they need these, these muscles, these massive muscles for the flight they do. So the court tip of hummingbirds is pretty phenomenal. So the males, of course, arrive soon. They arrive first. They also come up to their territories first and they'll be flying around looking for a spot that they decide is gonna be good enough for them to raise a family. And then what they're gonna do is they sit, they wait um, to, for a female to show up. And once a female shows up, they have these big elaborate flight displays that they all give off. And so this is an Anna hummingbird, of course, and what they do is they fly up and they uh, will flare their gorgets in front of the females. You fly back and forth, up and down, side to side. And in the case of this calliope, same thing. They just, that's to impress the females. And so what we found to some of the research is as we get these hummingbirds, sometimes you'll see a little hole. Uh, like when you catch the birds, I look at the gorget, and sometimes the gorget will not be 100% full. In other words, you'll see little white areas where the feather hadn't grown in yet. And something is just as simple as those one or two little holes where the feathers weren't completely filled in for the gorget that actually could make that particular male um, undesirable to a female. And she'll go to find another male that has a complete gorget. And they fly back and forth like this. And they also have these big elaborate flight displays. A lot of you have probably seen this where they'll, they'll start way high, they'll dive down really rapidly and fly real rapidly uh, around the female, fly back up and fly back and forth, these big dives. And those diving motions that they give are different for different species of hummingbirds, the way they fly up and down and side to side and so forth. But the biggest thing is for them to flare their gorget at the female. Um, and then it's diving up and down. And it's really kind of fascinating to watch these little guys. And they're really amazingly fast too. So as far as the nesting goes, the female has to create the nest all by herself. So the female hummingbird has to find the location she likes, and then she has to build her nest. And a lot of the nest is actually created with a number of items. It's usually um, cotton. You can like if you want to attract hummingbirds in the springtime, not just putting out the hummingbird, but you, you, you could put out cotton. And they'll take little pieces, pieces of cotton to use that for their nest. And this is what a finished nest looks like. The nests are actually made, at least for the broadtail hummingbirds, of usually lichen, small pieces of bark, um, maybe some pine needles, and then they're kind of woven together with spider web. As we're banding hummingbirds, we catch them. We often find uh, spider web on the feet of the hummingbirds, sometimes wrapped around their bill. It's really kind of fascinating. And we just usually take that off of the hummingbirds just to make it easier on them. So the female does all the nesting by herself. So she does all of it uh, completely alone. She builds the nest, she lays the eggs, she incubates the eggs all by herself. At least for the broad-tailed hummingbirds, it takes about two weeks uh, for incubation. It takes about a week for her to build the nest, and then it takes about uh, two weeks for incubation. She does it all by herself, and she has no help from anybody at all. The males have no part in nesting at all. The uh, female does everything by herself which is kind of fascinating to think about these little guys. They can do all of that by themselves. There we go. So there's another view of, of the same nest. And so the nests are about the size of a, um, kind of about the size of a golf ball, maybe a little bigger, depending on the species of hummingbird, of course. And you can see her on the, the nest itself, which would be fascinating. Mm -hmm. This is what it looks like, which is incubating. And so if you just leave them alone, you know, get the images you want or video from a long ways off, they'll just sit there. Um, just don't bother them. And this is what nestlings look like. Uh, they're very small. The eggs of hummingbirds are about the size of Tic Tacs. And the nest itself 
is inside of the nest anyway is about the size of a walnut shell. And so the nest, as you can see here, is made of lichen and little pieces of grass or bark, uh, pine needles, maybe spruce needles. And then there's little pieces of cotton on the inside of the nest cup. And that's keeps really nice and soft. And then she lays her eggs, so the, as, as with all birds, of course, the shell is the last part of the egg to be formed. And so the, the female has to go out and be mated before the shell is formed. So birds typically lay eggs in the morning. Um, that's not for all birds, like barn owls can lay eggs any time of day or night. But for uh, smoothies, a lot of songbirds, they tend to lay their eggs in the morning. And so the female has to go out and get mated the day before, uh, before the shell is formed. And a lot of times when we're banding hummingbirds, we can look at the underside of the hummingbird and I blow on her belly. And sometimes you can actually see the shell, uh, the egg actually inside the bird. It's called being gravid. And you can see that inside the bird. Then you know the egg's gonna be laid the next day, uh, which is kind of neat. And she lays uh, two eggs. That very, very rarely you'll find three. But for the most part, there's not enough room in the nest for more than two little nestling hummingbirds. This is mom feeding the kids. If you look at her, that the kind of peach stuff on the top of her beak, that's pollen. So she's regurgitating nectar and insects for the babies. And the tongue of the hummingbird, very much like woodpeckers, uh, it starts you know, at the tip of the bill, but it goes back around and actually connects at the top of the head, kind of above the eyes. And then at the edge of the hummingbird's bill, at the tip of it, there's these little forks kind of forked backwards. And that's how as they put the tongue in to the nectar as it comes back out, those little those little forks that come back actually and all of the, the nectar to go into the bird's throat or crop, I should say. So again, she's feeding here the, the one hummingbird nestling that wants the most. And again, the chicks are on the nest for about three weeks. And hummingbirds, like all birds, will defend their nest. They'll defend a nest from anybody or anything. And here she's defending the nest from what she thinks this red-tailed hawk's gonna be an issue to her. But of course the red-tailed hawk could care less. It's not even looking at her. Uh, it was just looking around, but she thought it was a bit of a threat. And so she was harassing this red-tailed hawk, trying to get this hawk to uh, leave her territory. So again, hummingbirds remain in the nest for about three weeks, 20 days, 21 days, something like that, really based upon uh, food and availability and weather and so forth. And hummingbird nests, a lot of times they'll build a nest in these spruces just because they like to have something that's got cover above them. So as you're building their nest, as she builds her nest, it's usually pretty well hidden. It looks just like a little pine cone sometimes. And there's usually a bunch of spruce uh, branches above her to protect her from the, the rain or sun. And then here's the two little guys in the nest together. So and then the little guys are in the, in the uh, when they fledge, they're out, they, they can fly, but not terribly well when they first leave. And so mom actually has to feed the two of them. And so she's hanging out with the two kids for about a week. And then after that, those little ones are on their own. She's on her own. She's done for the season. And as far as I know, the broad-tailed hummingbirds do not uh, double clutch. But if I, if I remember correctly, black chin hummingbirds can actually raise two families per summer but the broad tails seem to only, only raise one family per summer. There's another shot of her as she feeds the youngsters. And so little, like a lot of birds, they, um, their feet are really weak, especially when they're, when they're first out of the nest. And so a lot of birds will lay in their sternum. You see this a lot with owls, specifically great horned owls. It's called sternal recumbency. They lay in their stomach. And you can see this little guy on the right is actually trying to lay on his sternum while he's perched. Uh, grasping on to make sure that he's not going to fall off his mom's feeding him. So, of course, hummingbirds, uh, like I said earlier, can fly forwards, backwards, and even upside down. This is based upon the way they, they fly, the way they hover. In order for a bird to hover like a kestrel or a shrike, uh, they have to push their tail forward in such a way that as the air is coming up to the bird, as the bird starts flapping its wings in its figure eight, and as the air is flowing around the wings, as it flows down toward the body, we have to have the tail slightly forward 
So as the air comes around the bird, it keeps it in place. So as they're hovering, there's a whole lot more to it than that, but that's, as you see hummingbirds, that's why you often see them hovering with the tail uh, open as they're hovering, because that's the, how they do that. The air flows down around the, the breast and the belly, goes into the tail, and then it keeps them in place. And then they can, of course, move their tail any way they want to move the subtle distances they want to move. And you'll see, of course, with all the hummingbirds. And also the, the bones and the wrist are fused together like a paddle that enables them to make that figure eight motion as well. Pretty amazing little creatures. So a little more detail on the hummingbirds themselves. Here's the male broad tailed hummingbird. Of course, it gets its name because the tail is flat or broad. And here's the male has that beautiful kind of a, a pinkish colored throat patch. Uh, here's one in my hand. And that's the, the beautiful gorget you can see here. And um, it looks very similar to what they call the, you know, the ruby throated hummingbird but the green coloration is different. And also the throat color is very different on the ruby throated versus the broad tail. And people often ask me, do we have uh, broad tails here? And we'll, we'll hear more about that in a minute. And here you can see the hummingbird, she'll, she'll sit often uh, in the sun, sometimes in the shade, but often in the sun to let that gorget glimmer. And that's how we can attract a female. And he's just sitting here in the sun on purpose, looking around. Uh, but courtship could have been over for this little guy. That's why he's not completely in the sun. But look at this neat how as the wind blows, uh, he can still stay in place. And you wonder why they make that sound. It's because the outer two primary flight feathers have a very distinctive shape to them. And that's why as the air cuts through that, it makes that what I call a metallic buzzing sound. The picture on the right is a a hummingbird that's had um, relatively fresh primary feathers. The picture on the right, you see the primaries are thinner, at least the, the outer primary is real thin, and that actually wears down just simply by wear. It isn't like they're running against things or hitting things, uh, it's just by, by wear, and that's so they molt those. The only time you won't be hearing the male broad tails making that metallic buzzing sound is when they've molted uh, P9 and 10, because uh, once those feathers are gone, of course, before they grow them in, they're not gonna be able to make that, that metallic sound. And also I've noticed that if it's really bad weather or cold or rainy, they can actually adjust how much that sound they wanna make as they're flying. And sometimes you'll hear them flying making almost no buzzing at all. And that's because they just wanna eat and not have any arguments, just eat and move on. When they're in their territories, they'll, they'll be very loud, of course, when they're flying, um, making that sound to either attract females or deter other males. And of course, the male itself. Oops. Here's the tail feathers of an adult male broad tailed hummingbird. You can see this, uh, the, the shape of the feathers is pretty phenomenal. And here is the juvenile male. And you see a pointed tail feathers. What we look for is that rust um, on the, 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 the tail feathers, the black, and then that rust, what we look for when we're aging these little guys, when we capture and ban them in the springtime, or the summer, I should say. And female broad-tailed hummingbirds, some will have a gorget. Um, you actually see some gorget feathers on the throat. Other times they'll just have spotting on the throat and other times the throat will be completely white and clean. And the, but the flight feathers are pointed but not anywhere near as pointed as they are with the adult males. But they come to a bit of a point and you can see how rounded the flight feathers are on these, um, the right wing of this female broad tail. And then the other thing about the females, oops, here's an adult female, there's a juvenile female. As you can just see the shape of the tail feathers different. A lot of birds, the tail feathers, the flight feathers are gonna be more pointed when they're juveniles. And then as they molt into their adult plumage, the tail feathers become and flight feathers become more truncated or squared off. Because I believe the pointed feathers are more aerodynamic, which means that the birds can fly it's easier for them to maneuver with more pointed feathers. And then as they become masters of flight, as they molt into their second year, the feathers become truncated or squared off because then they're stronger and it's better for the birds to have stronger flight feathers as they're migrating and hunting and, and just go throughout their territories. Here's the range of the broad-tailed hummingbird, the blue, excuse me, the, the peach is where they nest. 
and then that pink is where they winter in Mexico. As you see, there are, there are quite a few states here in the West. We have a lot of them here. In Estes, where I live, that's the, the, the number one hummingbird here is the broad-tailed, or the one that nests here, of course, as the broad-tailed is the one that we find here in the biggest numbers here in Estes. Maybe a little lower in Fort Collins, Lovell, you may find black chins more numerous, um, but up here, we have the broad tails most numerous. And of course, they're feeding. Uh, this is a, a neat shot I took of a, a juvenile uh, hummingbird feeding. You can tell it's a juvenile bird of looking at the back of the bird. You'll see there's a little tawny edge to every feather on the back. That tawny edge will actually wear off as the bird um, spends its time in the winter. And then that's the only time they'll have the feathers all completely the same coloration. Then as they come back up to second, third, and fourth years, you'll see several different shades of green on the back of the birds. Well, the Rufus hummingbird, of course, is named because it has a Rufus color or rust color on them. And this, as you can see a beautiful shot of the gorget, how it changes colors in the light. And these guys, uh, female Rufus hummingbirds, almost all of the adult females have a gorget. Some juvenile females, they'll just have a completely white throat other juvenile, juvenile females may have a few spots in the throat, but a lot of the juvenile female Rufus hummingbirds, the throat will be completely white. And of course, they're called the Rufus because of the, um, the coloration. And it's uh, one of the few hummingbirds that, uh, again, the female has uh, a bit of a gorget, other species as well, but for us and for where we live here in Colorado, the primary hummingbird we're gonna see, the female has a gorget, it's gonna be the Rufus. Here's where they live. Uh, the red is where they nest. The green is the spring migration. We'll start over again. So the blue on the bottom is where they winter, of course. Then the green is as they migrate in the spring. The red is where they nest. And then that yellow or ochre color, or kind of oranges, is the fall. And these birds have what's called a circular migration. So they come up from Mexico along the west coast and they start nesting from, say, Northern California up to southeastern Alaska, and then as they head south, they move inland and create kind of a big circle. It's like a big loop. It comes up the west coast, and then it comes, they come inland. They kind of come to Wyoming, Colorado, uh, and they're here now. There's not a lot of them here, but I saw my first one. I think it was July 3rd here. So the Rufus hummingbird is the farthest northern nesting hummingbird in the world. It's also the only hummingbird that's been, been documented in all 49 states. Uh, does not nest in all 49 states, but has been found in all 49 states. Uh, other friends of mine that ban hummingbirds have banned them in quite a few states uh, in the east. I know of some that have been in Wisconsin, Michigan, New York, uh, Florida. There's one in Florida, a male that wintered for eight years in the same neighborhood in Florida, and they're supposed to be in Mexico. So I guess the birds haven't uh, quite looked at the field guides and the range maps. Here's a little male on an aspen branch. Again, look at how he'll, he'll turn his head. Look how that gorget flares in the, in the bright sunlight. And again, what's neat about this image is how little the bird is compared to the, uh, the leaves. And I love how they can just perch on those branches as they move. Now the bird itself just sits perfectly fine. And the Rufus, of course, have the, the greenish or brownish forehead. Some of the birds will have a greenish back. There's a green back race of Rufus hummingbirds. When we're looking at the differences between the Rufus and an Allen's hummingbird, you have to look at the, the tail feathers and measure the tail feathers as well, the width of the tail feathers. So this is an adult male Rufus hummingbird, looking at that notch uh, on, the, on the tail and also the, the outer primary, outer tail feather being uh, a certain thickness, I believe it's three millimeters. And then a juvenile male will have the tail feathers be rufous and then dark brown, or it could be rufous brown or rufous brown and white. So female rufous will have green in the tail, juvenile male rufous will not have green in the tail. So here is uh, an adult female rufous. You see it goes from rufous to green to black to white. Here's a juvenile female Rufus. It goes again from Rufus to green to black and then some white. 
And also, if you look at the back, again, as I pointed out earlier, of all the hummingbirds, they have a little leading edge to all of the, their feathers on the back has a little rufous edge to it. And again, that'll wear off throughout the winter, the late fall and winter. But that's another way, to, a good way to tell if you've got juvenile versus adults, is look at the little rufous edge to the feathers on the back and the rump itself. So we always notice that these rufous hummingbirds are really aggressive. And why they're so aggressive is simply because these birds nest in the, up in Canada and Alaska. And when they're there, they need to procure a specific amount of property to sustain themselves with all of the, the flowers, the nectar, the insects. And if they're not that aggressive, they can starve themselves. And so they have to be that aggressive because of where they live. And that's ingrained in them. So as they migrate, it's just a constant thing for them. They have to be aggressive. That's just built into them. And so what I've noticed in the last several years, and I could be completely wrong, but I, I'm believing that in the last several years that the broad-tailed hummingbirds have become much more aggressive as well. And I think it's because there's many more rufous coming through and they just uh, figured out that they've got to defend themselves and really stick up for themselves along with these little rufous hummingbirds. And I think that may be why the broad-tails to me seem much more aggressive than they, than they did 20 years ago. Um, which I think is kind of, and that may just be me, but um, the Rufus, the other way to get the Rufus to um, kind of remain a little less, less aggressive is put several hummingbird feeders together in kind of a close knit group. Maybe put four or five of them maybe a, a foot apart. And then you'll see that the Rufus won't be able to be that aggressive because there's so many hummingbirds coming into your feeders that the Rufus will not be able to defend themselves against several hummingbirds. So if you just have one, the other thing you can do is you want to impress just the Rufus, have three or four feeders in one part of your property and a single feeder, uh, maybe 20 feet away, 20 yards away, whatever you want. And then that one roof is gonna go defend that one feeder and make himself happy. So next video you're gonna see is what we call sally ink. So the birds perch on the branch, just gonna fly out, grab an insect like a fly catcher, land back on the branch again. Oops. see flycatchers do that a lot. Um, the next thing you're going to see is, uh, if you've ever seen a, a bird scratch, the birds either scratch above their wing or underneath their wing. Um, that's the only two ways they really can scratch. Uh, and barn owls actually have a specific uh, little comb on the inside of their middle town that they use to actually comb out parasites. Um, but other birds just use it to comb um, a niche that they have, or maybe a, a tick or a flea or who, whatever. So the Calliope hummingbird, as I mentioned, uh, is actually the smallest nesting North American bird. And here's one in my hand with a quarter next to it. It's, uh, they're pretty remarkable little creatures. And they are, again, uh, have the longest migration of any bird in the world if you compare the length of the migration to the size of the bird. And again, the blue is where they winter and the pink is where they nest. And again, they have a circular migration as well. So I remember years ago, I was in Arizona in the springtime birding and I saw a calliope hummingbird on a feeder and everybody down there went crazy. And I didn't think anything of it because I see calliope hummingbirds in, in the, the summer in Estes Park, so it didn't, didn't even dawn on me. But to them, apparently it was a pretty big deal to have a calliope hummingbird uh, stop over because apparently they just, make a pretty quick shot from their wintering grounds to their nesting grounds and, and very few stopovers from what I understand. And so again, they have a circular migration as well. They'll go from Mexico up the West Coast and they'll hang out in uh, you know, Washington, up in Canada and Montana and so forth. Then they move inland and work their way south and come to Colorado. Well, I remember um, they've actually really increased in numbers because I moved here in 1989, we had no Calliope hummingbirds. I remember in the early 90s going to a friend's house to see my first calliope hummingbird. And now I routinely catch them here in Estes Park in Bandon. So the male calliope has a very unique little gorget. Here's one in my hand. This is a very tiny little bird, as you can see. Uh, and the gorget they have is, is made up of individual feathers that you can actually see in amongst the white throat. 
where other hummingbirds, at least our hummingbirds up here, have a full gorget that kind of covers their whole throat. But these guys, you can see the individual feathers. And um, they also have what's called a spatulated tail. So they have two center tail feathers that are side by side, uh, very tiny. And when, we, when we're catching juvenile um, calliope hummingbirds, we look at the tail. We're looking at the little rufous on the edge of the tail to discern whether we've got a male or female calliope when we catch these guys uh, in the spring or in the summer, I should say. So again, as we're seeing calliope hummingbirds, they have already made the migration south. So when we see the rufous hummingbirds and the calliope hummingbirds, they've finished nesting and they're already heading south. That's why they're only here for a short period of time. Now, most companies do not make hummingbird feeders adequate for calliope hummingbirds. And you'll see what this little guy here in a minute, he's trying really hard to get sugar water out of my feeder. These, look what he's got to do to really get down there. And so most, most feeders are not designed for calliope hummingbirds. And so he's trying really hard. He really wants that sugar water, but it's just a little too far for him. He's actually got to fly and hover over the opening of the bird feeder. Here's the black chinned hummingbird. Of course, so named because it has a black chin and then a purple throat or gorget. Here's the female on the left, the male on the right. Uh, they're in the same family as uh, the, or she is genus, I should say, as the uh, ruby throated hummingbird in the east. They look very similar, uh, movement wise and so forth, at least the females do. But there's certain things you can look at here. I'll show you how to tell them apart. Look at how the, so the whole throat looks black until it hits just the right amount of sun. Here's the purple. Those of you guys at lower elevations near maybe Fort Collins, Loveland, Longmont, you probably have more black chin hummingbirds than you have broad-tailed hummingbirds. Um, we do occasionally get them up here, but it's pretty rare to get a, bra a black chin hummingbird in Estes Park. Here's another feeder, of course. And the bill slightly curves downward for a black chin. And you can see that the green is very different shade of green than the broad tails. So how do we tell a female broad tail from female black chinned hummingbirds. First off, the broad tails have a peach colored flank or side. And the broad, the black chin is more kind of grayish or greenish on the side. The primaries of the broad tailed hummingbird are more straight and also come to a little bit more of a point where the primaries of the black chin hummingbirds are rounded and they're much thicker. They come to a big, thick, rounded edge for the female black chin. The back of the broad-tailed hummingbird is a beautiful uh, kind of a lime green, a really bright green color. Or for the black chin, it's more of a dull green or gray. And then right in front of the eye of the broad-tailed hummingbird, is kind of a tan, maybe sometimes even, a, even a, almost a whitish. And for the black chin, they've got a black line, almost make them look mean in front of the eye. And also the black chins have the bill slightly decurves. And also when the black chins are at a feeder, they pump their tail. When they're hovering, they often pump their tail. And the broad tails do not. Another look at these two um, in hand, here is, I was lucky enough to catch both a broad-tailed and a female, excuse me, a female broad-tailed and a female black chin hummingbird at the YMCA together. And so here's some comparisons. So for the look at the rufous, so the broad-tailed hummingbirds have rufous on the tail and the black chin hummingbirds do not have any rufous on the tail. Another look at them as well. So there's, and also you can look at, if you get them close enough, the white tip on the tail is more rounded for the broad-tailed hummingbirds and more a little uh, kind of uh, teardrop shaped for the black chins. And again, look at the tail. You can see the rufous on the broad tail and no rufous on the black chin. And that's a really good way to discern the two. And also the color is slightly different. It's a, lightly, a little bit more grayer, more gray for the black chin 
and more of a light lime green for the broad tail. So some other, uh, here's some female hummingbirds. Look at them. Here's the female broad tail. Here's a female calliope on the same feeder. Look at the difference in size. This is a female rufus. So some rufus, uh, the females actually will be green, but they, to me, they have this copper color kind of throughout. When I'm looking at these guys and I catch them in hand and have them in hand, the green almost has this like a copper colored wash to it for the rufus. And the black chin, of course, is, is darker, kind of a darker green, more of a, a grayish green. And then the primaries, of course, are wider. And then they got that black in front of the eye versus the pale of the of the broad tail. So it's kind of a good way to look at the difference of the four hummingbirds we have here. So as far as the research goes, um, I'm a hummingbird researcher. And what I do is I ban a lot of hummingbirds, several hundred a year. And so when I, we have to make everything ourselves for hummingbirds. We have to make the bands ourselves. We have to make the traps ourselves. We have to make any of the pliers for ourselves. Anything we're going to do, you can buy some of that stuff. But um, I made my own pliers. Um, and you have to make the bands. You got to cut each one of these things into a strip. And then you cut each individual band to the size adequate for the species of hummingbird you're going to band. And the reason for this is like, if we're going to band, you know, house finches are going to band black throated sparrows, or we're going to band kestrels. Um, it's got a universal band size for them. It's a 1B for the, for the uh, house finches, a 3B for the, the kestrels and so forth. So we order those as we need them from the banding laboratory. But because there's so many different size bands for various hummingbirds throughout the country, banders have to make the bands themselves. And so this is how the bands come into me. And then I've got to cut each one uh, to the proper size for the species I'm going to band, like 5.4 millimeters, 5.6 millimeters, depending on the species I'm going for. And then I form them, kind of file down the edges, and I form them in a little bit of a, a U shape, and I put them in wax by number. And then this is what they look like in comparison to a penny. That's how small hummingbird bands are. And hummingbird banding itself, oops. So just looking at the hummingbird banding itself, there's the, again, the clive in my hand. And here is one of my Rufus hummingbirds. I just put a band on. And so you can see how tiny the band is on the Rufus hummingbird. And for me to band the birds, you'll see in a minute, I put them in a little ring. I actually was trying to figure out one day, how in the world am I gonna hold this hummingbird to band it? And I thought, you know, I, I just had a, a great one owl that I banded that got electrocuted here in Estes Park. And so I thought that little band I'm putting on the, to put on the horned owl, that's probably the perfect size to fit a hummingbird. Sure enough, it turns out it is. And so I put hummingbirds in a little number eight band to band them. Now this little guy, this is actually weighing a calliope hummingbird. So this is a little ring, it's a smaller ring. I believe it's a, it's a 7A, if those of you don't know band, bird bands and band sizes, I believe it's a 7A. And um, this is perfect for the calliope hummingbird. I pre-weigh the band, then I tear it, if you know what that is. In other words, I, I subtract that the weight of the band. I put the bird in the band and then I put that on the scale as you see. And so this little calliope hummingbird weighs 2.7 grams. What's really interesting about the hummingbirds is as they're starting to migrate out of here, to look at the, the hummingbirds, to look at the fat, we look at the, we blow onto the throat patch and we can look at the fat of the hummingbird by then. So some of these little guys will go from say roughly a broad tail goes about three grams or so, 3.3 grams, something like that. They can go up to as, almost six grams. In other words, they almost double their weight before they migrate. So then the research itself is, um, what we found through our research is the oldest hummingbird on record is 15 years old. My oldest hummingbird that I captured and then recaptured the YMCA lived to be 10 years. And as far as we know, she's still out uh, flying around. Then as far as males versus females, uh, female hummingbirds tend to live longer than males. Uh, I've had several male hummingbirds I've captured that have been uh, seven years or less and several females that have been, you know, between three and 10 years um, 
but the oldest female I know of was 12 years old. And now the oldest known one is 15 years old. So the band numbers themselves from 1961 to 2020, there'd been 30,300 broad-tailed hummingbirds banded in Colorado and only 384 encountered. That means either someone found it dead, somebody recaptured the bird and read the band number. Uh, but in that same time frame, there's only been less than 5,000 black chin hummingbirds banded and only 13 encountered. And the biggest part of that is there's so few of us banding hummingbirds. There's three of us that I know of that band hummingbirds. Uh, Steve Barish, as you know about, and his wife, Debbie, and then Fred and Tina England, and then myself. Um, and only one, you know, three of us have the banding permits and then the, the others assist with the banding itself. And then band recoveries, uh, there's a broad billed hummingbird that was banded in Louisiana that Steve Barish has recaptured in Grand Junction. And then there's a roof hummingbird that was banded in Louisiana that recovered in British Columbia. So it's pretty remarkable where the birds moved to. Um, then all of our birds go north and south. A lot of the birds actually go east and west. So this is, uh, when hummingbirds bathe, they have to bathe a lot because of course they get a lot of uh, sugar on themselves and nectar on themselves. And, and so they get sticky quite a bit. So they bathe a lot, but they have to find areas where the water is running very, um, kind of very thin so they don't drown. And so if you've never seen a hummingbird bathe, this is what it looks like. So they have to get themselves, you know, as wet as they can and clean, but they also have to make sure they can fly away, uh, not so waterlogged that they can't fly. Um, and so that's um, kind of a fun little thing. If you ever see a hummingbird bathe, it needs some running water really for them to bathe. A bird bath just doesn't quite cut it for them. The water has to be running for them in order to bathe. And so again, some of us ban hummingbirds. And here's a video on, on banning hummingbirds. There's my hummingbird trap that I built. I'm going to extract it now. Very simple process. Let's reach in, grab the hummingbird. Here's the hummingbird. So this is an adult female broad-tailed hummingbird. And I know this because I see the different shades of green on her back. So she's molting. The pretty dark green are the new feathers coming in and the light green are the old feathers from uh, last year. So I've already pre-weighed this ring. This ring is actually from a great horned owl. It's a band I put on a great horned owl years ago and it got electrocuted and so I realized the band fits perfectly around the hummingbirds. And with this little knob right here, it enables me to have the bird sit on the scale. I have pre-weighed the ring and so if you look over here you'll see the hummingbird weighs exactly four grams. So here's the hummingbird band itself. The band number is M58 Nine it should be five six nine nine seven. And the banding process is actually very simple. I just put it in my little forceps here. 
the little bird's leg out. Then I may just make sure that the band rolls around the bird's little leg. Closes tightly. That's the process. Here's the bird. So I measure her tail with this cord measure. She's 28 millimeters for the tail. And I measure her wing. Forty nine millimeters. Write down the age of the bird, the sex of the bird. Then to check the fat, to see how fat the little bird is, we're actually gonna blow right around the neck of the bird, and then we look for fat. She actually has no fat whatsoever. So four grams is actually a pretty good weight for this little guy, a little girl I should say, and she is gonna be on her way south as soon as I let her go. So when you hold a hummingbird, you never hold it by the legs, if you do, you run the, risk, run the risk of the legs literally breaking off the bird. It's an adult, female, broad-tailed hummingbird. Let me pull it back out of the light. There we go. And to let her go, we just put it on your hand, she'll fly away. That's the whole process. The difference between a band for a great horned owl and a band for a hummingbird. Hummingbird, of course, is on the right. I'm going to slide a penny in here just so you get an idea how small it is compared to a penny because it's pretty remarkable how little these things are. You all know how big a penny is, that's how small the leg band is for a hummingbird. Hummingbird bands compared to a penny. So here's just a few um, rare hummingbirds. We get a, a hummingbirds that show up in Colorado that are often considered rare. Some of these include the violet crowned hummingbird, Anna's hummingbird, broad billed hummingbird, white eared hummingbird, blue throated and magnificent hummingbirds, Ruby throated hummingbird, and little Costas hummingbird. So, of course, we feed hummingbirds sugar water. And so, um, people often ask, you know, what is the ratio for sugar water? And for what I use is I usually use just white sugar and use hot water. You can boil it, you can run it through taps hot enough, you can just run it through. As long as the sugar's dissolved, you can just run the water through your tap. Uh, or you can boil it if you'd like, but then make sure it's cool or cold before you put it into the, the feeder itself. And I use three parts water to one part sugar. Other people say you can use one, one part sugar to four parts water. Uh, and I did that. I actually made an experiment a number of years ago. I had several hummingbird feeders out and I made sugar water, you know, five to one, four to one, three to one, and so forth. And it turns out that they, they would come through and check every hummingbird feeder but then they would spend most of their time at the one that was three parts to one part. And so that's what I use that for. And then just do is just make sure it gets dissolved, stir it up, cool it, and then put it in the feeder. So as far as cleaning your feeders go, you know, make sure you use soap and water. Uh, you can use bleach if you want, but just make sure whatever you use, that the feeders are really well rinsed out because if the birds taste the, the sugar, taste the soap or the bleach, they're not gonna come back to your feeders very quickly. And so it's also not good for them to, take, to have that soap or specifically bleach on them. So make sure that they're rinsed out really, really well. Smell them. Make sure they don't smell like, like soap or bleach before you put uh, the feeders back in. And if you get black mold, make sure you use a, a Q-tip or a toothpick and make sure that's cleaned out really well so that none of the black molds at the openings of the feeders. And so the uh, 
um, question I always get is, how long do I keep my feeders up? Well, I tell people that you keep your feeders up to at least the middle of October or two weeks after you see your last hummingbird because you're not going to keep, um, there's the next one. So, and after October 1st, you know, change the sugar water every three or four days. And depending on how hot it is, uh, make sure you change the sugar water out so it doesn't get rancid. Um, and the reason I keep my feeders up is for this question right here. I get this all the time. Will keeping feeders up stop birds from migrating? And it's, it's no, because the rufous hummingbirds, uh, when they're here, they're already making their migration south. So they've already left their nesting grounds, they're already heading south. And I have bird feeders up in my yard all year long. And I get you know tons of house finches, cassins finches, pine, pine siskins in the summer, but in the winter they're gone. And so if feeders kept the birds here, these birds would be here year round. And if keeping your hummingbird feeder up actually keeps the birds here, hummingbirds would be here year round. And the sugar water is nothing more than a supplement to the bird's diet. So again, um, I'm the director of, the, of Colorado Avian Research and Rehabilitation Institute or Cary. We do have a store. You're welcome to take a look at that store. We have all kinds of wonderful things there that uh, we sell to help raise money for the efforts that we do, the rehabilitation and the research we do. I'm actually taking care of a great horned owl right now. Um, he was found on the ground with an injured wing. Um, I got his wing wrapped and getting some medication and feeding him. Uh, some of the stuff we have, we have you know, bed spreads, we have um, cups, we have note cards, original art. Um, we have all kinds of cool stuff on the store. Um, and again, the end results of my research is to write books, uh, make videos, uh, do whatever uh, can help educate the public on the birds and what they do and how they do what they do. Uh, the barn owl book, of course, that talks all about the research we're doing on barn owls, uh, small mountain owls. We learned about that a little bit, great horn owls as well and so forth. So I appreciate all of your time. Um, if you guys have any questions, I'm here to answer any questions you guys might have. Very nice, Scott. Thank you. you Do you see the chat? Uh, can you see the chat? Uh, I can see it, yeah. So why don't you, you, you read through some of those questions then? Uh, Well, I, I'm trying to figure, I never read these before, so I have to figure out. So where does it start at the top? Yeah, I think it does. Yeah, question, okay. Um, when do they mate before nest building? And so from what I understand that, no, she'll start she'll start nest, mating after the nest is finished because again, the egg has to be fertilized, or the, the embryo has to be fertilized before the egg is created. And so it takes her a week to build a nest so she's gonna start looking for a mate, for someone to mate with her um, after the nest is finished. Next question says, what is the difference uh, gorget versus the neck feathers? And I went to, I kind of explained that with what the gorget is. It's that it's, it's, they have the platelets in those feathers that reflect uh, like oil on the surface of water, which the other feathers do not have. And then for these species, the gorget encompasses the chin and throat area, its iridescent feather areas. Right. Uh, but again, the black chin hummingbird has the, the, the chin is not iridescent, it's just black. It's the throat that has those purple iridescent feathers. Um, and it says these slides need to be labeled. I is that, that was, that was a, a comparison between black chin? Hummingbird and broad-tailed hummingbird, the first comparison slide you showed. Oh, gotcha. Um, wouldn't she be having a fat to adequately migrate? Um, they're talking about that hummingbird that weighed four grams. Um, yeah, no like fat. I said, yeah. Correct. Normally they have, the ones I've caught have been anywhere from, uh, the lightest broad tail I've ever caught was 2.9 grams. The heaviest broad tail I ever caught was 4.7 grams which is pretty remarkable because the average weight is about 3.1 to 3.4 grams is the average weight of a hummingbird. So again, uh, and they don't make as, you know, if, if she's four grams, um, she may make a small, shorter migration route. In other words, she may go from Estes Park, say to Lyons, and then fatten back up again there and then go farther. 
if they have much more fat in, on them, then they can make a much farther migration like the, the ruby throats have to do to fly across the Gulf of Mexico. You know, the broad tails are fortunate and, and the calliopes and, and so forth because they can go down into Mexico, they don't, don't have to cross the, um, they don't have to cross the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and here it says, is it important to use cane sugar? I've heard beet sugar is inadequate. I've always used cane sugar. I've never used beet sugar for my feeders. And so I, I've never had beet sugar myself anyway that I know of. I just always use cane sugar for just my own eating and also my, um, my uh, sugar water for the hummingbirds. And as far as the hummingbirds territory, uh, I find so few hummingbirds that uh, I could not answer that question. I do not look for hummingbird nests in the ever. It just isn't my thing. If I happen upon one, that's great, but I do not look for hummingbird nests. So I cannot tell you how big the territories are for nesting hummingbirds. I would presume they are, I would guess that they're probably, you know, uh, a few, maybe 10 or so yards. Or I, really, I really couldn't tell you. I have no idea. Uh, Oh, and here it says there are two banding projects in Southwest Colorado that have been going on for 12 to 15 years. One in Denton and one in Mesa Verde National Park, it looks like. Um, I'd love to share some techniques. Sure. Um, and so actually when I started banding hummingbirds, I was uh, the only person I knew of in the entire state. And I didn't even know very little about hummingbird banding. I just had to start catching a bunch at the YMCA. And so when I was banding hummingbirds, I um, actually talked to my mentor, which was Ron Ryder, and I said, I've got hummingbirds, I'd like to catch them. He just gave me, ordered me some, the strip of bands I showed you. And I said, what do I do? He goes, well, just cut them and put them on birds. And so I started doing that. And it wasn't until I met up with Steve Baricious and Fred Ingleman that I learned all about the better techniques for banding hummingbirds. Um, and that was, God, now it's been over 20 some years, 20, some, 25 years now, uh, banding hummingbirds. And the funny thing about it is we, I, catch, I used to catch a lot of Fred Engelman's hummingbirds. He would ban the Moraine Park and I would ban at the YMCA. We'd catch a lot of each other's birds all the time. Um, and then we had a hummingbird conference here years ago up at Peaceful Valley, south of Estes. And one of Fred's birds banned in Moraine Park was actually covered, recovered in Peaceful Valley, which was kind of impressive. I had one of my bands, birds banned in Estes Park recovered in, uh, I believe down near Gothic, Colorado. That's as I'm far as I've got hummingbirds. Scott, I'll mention that Steve Baricious is going to be doing a banding demonstration for the workshop at Peaceful Valley, which is in Boulder County, at his home. Uh, just, you can sign up for that on the website, which is cobridge.org, upcoming events. It's limited participation, so if you're interested in that, sign up quickly. And Scott, you're going to be doing a, a banding demonstration as well. You want to do you want to mention anything about that? I'm. Uh... Um, Sue Riffle found a spot for me to band because I was really interested in some black chin hummingbirds and doing something down in the valley more like say Loveland or some area down that way, that way Fort Collins someplace just because it'd be a lot easier for people to get to than doing up here in Estes Park uh, and also down if I was some, able to do someplace in the foothills I might be able to get a wider variety of species so the black chin hopefully the black chin the Calliope the Rufus and the Broadtail all three is my hope and so she found me a spot, but uh, we have to get the date set up because I've got other stuff going on. Um, I think bird walks over near a place called Devil's Thumb. I'm in two different bands I play on weeks. The weekends, it's just difficult for me to, to get set up for that. So I'm trying to figure out um, uh, dates is going to work. And so we get the date set up, I'll let you guys know. I'll just say that um, we'll be adding more workshop, field workshops, events to the website over the next few weeks. A watch for Scott's banding demonstration. And also there's gonna be additional workshops held in the West Slope that have not yet been set up. So watch for those. Um, Scott, you mentioned rare hummingbirds. And I was surprised that violet crowned hummingbird is on your list. Has that ever occurred in the state of Colorado? From what I, from what I was told, um, there, was, there was one that showed up in the state. I don't remember the details of it, but that's why I put it in there. I can't, um, I don't remember the details of it, but that's why I put that in there. 
Okay. I was told, might have been Steve Barishas might have told me that. I, I would say it was a long time ago. I just don't remember the details as far as who who found it or uh, who told me about it. And I believe Mexican violet ear has now been seen in the state, I think, two times. That's another oh, species wow. for people to be on the lookout for. And uh, I know and that, the, what, in years past, we've had what, the magnificent uh, Rivoli's hummingbird that showed up uh, a number of times in the state, from what I, from what I remember. There's one what, up by North Park, was it two years ago, when it showed up? In North Park? Uh, one in Boulder County. Because there was one at somebody's campsite up in, I thought it was North Park, someplace I thought. Uh, I think it was in Larimer County, actually. But yeah, been, yeah. there have, have not been very many chaseable ones, but it's certainly a species to be on the lookout for. Now, you mentioned yeah. Magnificent Hummingbird and Blue Throat Hummingbird, but they have new names now, don't they? Say that again? Those two species have new names. Which two? Magnificent and blue throated hummingbirds. Right. The magnificent is the, the Rivoli's, but the, the blue throated, I don't know if that name changed. I don't know about it. It's blue throated mountain gem. Oh, and that's something. Yeah. Yeah. Another book to write, I guess. Another book to buy, I should say. Are there any other questions for Scott? And if, if anybody wants to come off, uh, you know, turn on their microphone, you can do so now. When somebody asked about the, the, uh, there's hummingbird feeders at the YMCA at my banding station, and it's there every day. You can go there any day, every day, and watch the birds. There's band-tailed pigeons, and there's gross beaks, and there's uh, uh, a lot of hummingbirds. There's uh, all kinds of good birds there. We've documented, we've banded 94 species there and caught over f almost 15,000 birds. If you want to get to the banding station, um, go to, you know, enter the YMCA. Uh, go past the miniature golf and the and the um, the tennis courts. You go to Mineral Drive. Very simple. You can't miss it. It's, it's, the, it's the second road, first road just past the, the mini golf. It's called Mineral Drive. Just turn right, and then you go up to the second driveway. Turn right, and you'll see a sign for the banding the banding bird banding station. I just drive in there and park, and you're welcome to come down. We band Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays from about four to six. I'm usually there by three o'clock, so you're welcome to come down and, and see what we capture and, and look at the hummingbirds and uh, the band-tailed pigeons there every day. It can be up to 40 of them there. So yeah, if you want to do that, just come to the banding station to Y. Okay, there are currently seven workshops listed on the website. Uh, does anybody have any questions about those? Uh, well, Scott, we can hold on the line for another minute or so in case anybody has an additional question. Sure. And thank you very much, Scott, for a very informative presentation. Uh, we really appreciate all the work you do with, with Carrie as well. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for having me do this. Appreciate it.